Dr. David Schramm is known as Dr. Dave on the campus of Utah State University and across the country. He is currently an associate professor of and family life extension specialist in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. Uh, he has a bunch of education. He's been around the nation. He has um, been on television monthly on Fox 13's The Place. He, uh, his drive is to help individuals, parents, and couples thrive in their life journeys. From British Columbia to Beijing, China, from St. Louis to San Diego, Dr. Dave has given over 500 presentations, classes, and workshops to a variety of audiences, including the United Nations and a TEDx talk in Florida. He married his high school sweetheart, Jamie, and they have four children. Uh, he also loves peanut M&Ms, and he lives in, with his family currently in North Logan, Utah. We'll turn it over to Dr. Dave. Hey, thanks so much. Um, man, Davis County team, I appreciate it. This is wonderful. I love what you're doing. And just in case, yeah, here, here's my peanut m and I'm running low. So I go through one of those a week about. No, hey, I'm, I'm so excited to, to talk about this topic. I think it's such a, an important topic that can be, uh, is relatable to, to everyone. I know it's a bummer that we have to do this um, virtually, but uh, if you're like me, right, it's tie up top and then my, my joggers on the bottom. All right, let's be real. Um, but I'm going to share some things I think that will be helpful for you um, personally and professionally in your family and your relationships. And so I'm going to share my screen and we will uh, we'll jump right in. Now, fair word of, of warning. I'm going to go fairly fast <laughs> through this. And so I, I share the slides. If you want the slides, they're, they're available. Uh, you can get them at the drdaveshram.com. Uh, but let's jump right in because it's been a, man, it's been a crazy year right? Nice cup of 2020. And then, yeah, the, it feels like that that's what we've had. We've taken this right, right to the face. Here's Matthew McConaughey. Um, yeah, January 1st. And then by what, June 9th, it was just, it was awful. It's just this horrible, awful experience that we've had um, collectively, individually. Um, but it's important, I think, to, to look also at the more, the more humorous side. There has been some, some funny things that have happened. Here's, here's a, I love this one. When this was first started and, and masks weren't really out and people were uh, panicking, we just didn't know what to do. I love this, the scotch, right? The scotch pad right there. She's probably, <laughs> there's probably more fumes in that one that, um, than the, the coronavirus there for that one. Um, but here's Elf on the Shelf. I don't know if you received your Elf on the Shelf this year. This is what we, we received in the mail. And then uh, American Girl Doll, if you're an American Girl Doll fan, this is what homeschool Heather, this is what it looked like this, this year. Uh, but now school is shut down um, and it was just a, a, just a really weird time for a lot of people and time of isolation, and we'll get to all of that. But really, I have to be honest, when school finally was back in session, we have four kiddos, four teenagers. And I did, I was like, oh yeah, I love my kids. I promise I love my kids. But when they went back, it was just this feeling of, of yes, you know, some type of, of normalcy for them and, and for, for me as well. But on the, on the more serious side, so I've tracked, uh, I've really paid attention to the happiness. I'm interested in what this has done with Americans in our families, in our individual lives. And honestly, it's taken quite the hit. Uh, the happiness has tanked. It's never been so low that we've dipped this historic low of 50 years that we've been in this, this unhappiness. Now, I don't know how uh, accurate Twitter is, but they have this hedonometer that tracks um, how happy Twitter is over time and really kind of this pulse in the, in the nation and the world. And you can see with the, the protests and the, the brutality and the things that are happening of, of what has happened in our nation just this past year. Now, yes, or just last night, I actually, I added this new one. And if you take a, a close look at all the things, it has the, the storming of the U.S. Capitol right there, and it shows that it's taken this... this country. And it is. So we have had a, a bitter year, honestly. And so how do we become better after experiencing the bitter? And I hope to be able to share some things that will be helpful for, for you in your lives. First off, let's start with, I think fundamentally, we have to get, understand this, that we are all born with three fundamental human needs. 
Okay, ultimately we're born with the need for safety. It's this, this drive to survive. So it's food, clothing, and shelter, emotional safety as well. And when that need is met, then the result is I feel at peace. The second need that we all have is the need for satisfaction. The need for the bowl of ice cream or our, right, our diet, Dr. Pepper, that's my drink of choice. It's to be able to do fun, enjoyable things, to go out, to enjoy life, but it's also professional development. It's, it's yearning for learning. It's this desire to acquire things and have recognition and, and do fun, enjoyable things. And when we have that need met, we feel contentment. Now, the third need that we all have is connection. We're all born with this longing for belonging, really, this craving for connection with, with other people. And those are formed from all kinds of things. Here's a few with gratitude and kindness and empathy. And when that need is met, we feel love. Okay, now, I want to point out real quick that the pandemic, as much as, as it done, has done for, right, for, for the nation, our country, for the world, what it ultimately has done it has crushed these three needs. Now, it's one of the few things historically that has wiped out all three needs at one time. For safety, that's an obvious one. Physical safety, emotional safety, satisfaction. Can't go out and for that period of time. We couldn't go out to restaurants. We couldn't do things um, that were fun, enjoyable. Our kids were cooped up and it was driving them nuts. We had to come up with these you know, home movies and videos and, and they all went viral on Facebook and Instagram. And we couldn't see our loved ones. And many of us still can't see our, our parents, our loved ones, those in care centers were separated. And so that, that need for connection uh, has been crushed. And so big picture, we, we have to remember these three fundamental human needs, not only for you, but for your, your children as well. And we'll come back to these throughout. So safety, satisfaction, and connection are, are key, fundamental for, for flourishing. Okay, so how does stress affect us? I think we all, we all get this. I won't spend too much time on this, but ultimately it affects how we think, what we feel and and what we do so we'll have this experience a situation will occur whether it's a a miscarriage or a divorce or we get in a car accident or something happens and then we have a thought a thought like oh no what's going to happen and then it turns into emotion which is uh, fear or anger and worry anxiety and then behavior and sometimes it's it's non-behavior sometimes it's just we shut down and we can't function we don't do anything and other times it's we, we um, act irrationally and we go out and we buy, we hoard toilet paper or those kinds of things. And so you see what the pandemic has done. It's a, a thought, an experience, and then this thought, and then it creates this emotion, and then behavior. And, and ultimately what overwhelming stress does, now some stress is good and it motivates us. A little bit of stress can kind of get us a kick in the pants and get us going. But stress ultimately turns us inward and then makes us look downward. And that's the opposite of happiness. Happiness is we search inward and then we turn outward when we're happy. But stress and anxiety and depression, they all do the exact opposite. We, we turn inward. So stress, we know it from the right the doctor visits and it's linked to the six leading causes of death, all those horrible things. And that's true. But I hope by the end of, of this hour that we'll, we'll have a better understanding of what we can do to, to help uh, with some of that. So again, big picture. We experience, here's, you know, we're going along in life. We experience a crisis. There's a period of, of disorganization. Think about it in your own life, something that has happened and then disorganization um, occurs after that. Let's say a separation, a divorce, again, or your teenager gets pregnant, something happens and disorganization from kind of the normal um, way things are going. And then there's a period of reorganization. Sometimes things will never be the same again, a death or a divorce or disease, something has happened and the kind of the new normal is, is down uh, lower than the normal. Sometimes we rise back up and sometimes we're actually resilient and come up above that. So what are some of those factors? And that's what I'm going to talk about. What separates those who do really well and those who kind of tank off? All right. Understanding big picture. I'm going to get a little um, professory on you, but uh, this is not a complicated model, right? We have a stressor event, which leads to stress and crisis, but it depends. And it depends on two major things. One is the resources, which I'll talk about, but I'm gonna spend most of the time talking about perception and things that, that influence our perception, things that you have control over. And so that's, that's the big picture, that's where we're going. So let's start with resources. So what resources do you have? Where, where, where do you turn? 
is that, and sometimes, right, people will turn to social media or they'll turn to friends or loved ones or a faith group or a, a pet, right? We have our Yorkie here and he's become really attached. He's, so if he starts barking, you'll know that he, he's right here. He's one of the, yeah, he, he brings us joy and comfort during um, tough times, but it can be all kinds of things. And so turning to others, I want to highlight and, and spend just a minute on, on relationships because that is one of the, the strongest predictors of, of how well um, that we do. So all kinds of things that we can rely on uh, as far as resources, helping us through a tough time. One of these being a conference, right? We come together, we learn new things. That's one of the three needs, right? Satisfaction, desire to learn um, new things. So there was a study done at, at BYU, uh, meta-analysis, so it looks at all these factors that predict um, how long and how well we'll, we'll live in this life. So you start right there, clean air, not a strong, cash valley sometimes it seems like in these inversions that the, the clean air is a predictor, but overall not a, not a strong predictor. Hypertension treatment, being lean versus overweight, not as strong as you would think. Um, exercise, and other studies have actually shown that exercise deserves to be further um, down on the left. It's a stronger predictor. Um, more recent studies have shown that. Cardiac rehab, the flu vaccine, interesting, right? I won't get into the whole vaccine thing, but the science shows that the flu vaccine is a strong predictor of staying alive. Quitting drinking, quitting smoking. Okay, the final two. What are some of the strongest predictors of staying alive? We just talked about it close relationships. So what's number one? Number one, the strongest predictor of us staying alive is, you'll never guess, quitting Fortnite is actually the strongest predictor. Okay, no, it's not. It's not. So those who are not Fortnite, just ask your, ask your teenagers. So, or take a picture of this and then show your teenagers and be like, hey, you know, Dr. Dave, show that you're not going to stay alive if you keep, you keep playing this video game. It's actually social integration. Social integration and close relationships. Those trump everything, right? Genetics and, and smoking and all these other factors that science has shown. Close relationships, that's who you're quarantined with. Social integration is the, the other, you know, eight hours a day that many of us spend either at work with our colleagues or our religious, our faith community, um, people at the grocery store, those people that we interact with, that's social integration and close relationships. So those are some of the, the most important resources that we can turn to. But what's happened during the pandemic? Again, this shouldn't be a surprise. This is connection. But we've been isolated, socially um, isolated and distanced from, from other people, which has taken its, its toll. Uh, if you're into TED Talks, I'm a, a big TED Talk fan. Look this one up. It's one of Dave's faves, one of my favorite ones. And it's a study on, on happiness, but they followed it now. It's over 80 years long that they followed people. Now they're into the third generation, like their grandkids. And they've studied what predicts, again, how long and, and how well people live. And it's this. He says this, Robert says, the clearest message that we get from the 75-year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. People who are more socially connected to family, to friends, to community are happier, they're physically healthier, and they live longer than people who are less well connected. And good relationships don't just protect our bodies, they protect our brains. So checking in, even virtually checking, it's not the same, but for now, checking in, phone calls and FaceTimes and Zooms, it's, it's critically important for people, especially during traumatic events, to have someone there to, to talk with. Okay, so um, we won't talk too much about this, but for those who are not familiar with, with ACEs, these adverse childhood experiences, so it was back like 1998, this uh, amazing study that showed, and you see the 10 areas there, that just real 10 questions, 10 areas from divorce or substance abuse, or you had a parent in prison, for each one, they, they check a little box. And what they found is that the more boxes of those 10 that you check, the higher likelihood you are to experience all kinds of um, disruptions in neurodevelopment and in, in relationships, and ultimately um, shorter lifespans. And so that's what that ACEs study has, has shown. But I like to look at the positive side. If you know me, I love to look, okay, what's the opposite? What's, what's, you can't do much about what happened in the past but you can do something about the present. And so I love this other study, this health outcomes of positive experiences or hope. And, and that study has shown really, why do some kids do this? Why do they do well and are resilient? And why do some tank? And that's what this study shows. And it shows ultimately what we're talking about resources. It, it talks about 
wonderful positive experiences that children have. So they can just have crummy childhoods, many of them, but having a mentor or a coach or a religious leader or a parent or step parent or grandparents, someone that, that comes in and fills that to give them hope and to help them through those, those tough times. And so again, resources in, in that little diagram when stressor events, having resources and relationships are some of our most um, impactful resources that we that we have but i'm going to jump to perception and i want to spend the rest of the time there because that's something that we have um, more control over is how we perceive things and so we'll, we'll talk about perception and we'll talk about really these these areas that i have on the screen we'll talk first a little bit about stress get into some brain and neuroscience stuff don't worry i'll, I'll keep it light um and and hopefully interesting to you and then we'll talk about distraction and how easily our brains get distracted, especially on Zooms, right? It's, it's tough. I know it, I know it, so hang in there. And then we'll talk about some positivity stuff, some things that you can actually do starting today to improve the positivity and actually create an upward spiral in your brain. Okay, so question for you. Think about this um, on a scale of one to 10. So this was a study, let me back up. So this was a study at Stanford and it was 30,000 adults and they were followed for eight years. So 30,000 adults followed for eight years and they were asked these questions and lots of other questions. But these are the two that, um, that I wanna focus on. The first question, how much stress did you experience the last year? Okay, now just think about it, 2020, on a scale of one to 10, what would you say? You can put it in the, in the chat if, you, if you'd like as well. Just what would you say? One to 10. And then that second question, do you believe stress is harmful for your health? And it's, 10 would be, uh, yes, you know, strongly agree that stress is harmful to your health. Okay. So yeah, a lot of people saying, yeah, high stress and they, they had a really rough year. And yes, I believe that stress is harmful to my health. Okay. This is, this is what they found with this. They found that those who answered, a t you know, like at eight, nine, ten, that they they had a really uh, tough year with a lot of stress in the past year, experienced a forty three percent increased risk of dying the following year. So these thirty thousand adults, and every year they're measuring, if they said yes, they experienced a lot of stress, forty three percent increased risk of dying, but only only if they also answered strongly agree. but also believing that stress is harmful to your health. And so that, what does that mean? That kills about 20,000 people every year. Not, not stress, but believing that stress is harmful to your body. That's what's killing people. Um, and it kills pe more people than, than skin cancer and HIV and even homicide every year, not stress, but believing that stress is harmful to your body. And so what, you're like, wait, what? Guess who had the lowest risk of death in this study? Those who had high stress, but didn't believe that it was harmful to their health. You're like, wait, what? It's, it's true. So listen, listen to the TED Talk by uh, Kelly McGonigal uh, at Stanford. It's amazing. And it changes, hopefully, our perception of stress, that when we feel stress, instead of being like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this is happening, take a breath, take a time out, and think, oh my goodness, this is my body preparing me, my heart rate and my respirations. This is my body preparing me for this experience or for this event. And so I want to come back again, back to the diagram, because look, when you change your mind or your perception about stress, or when you choose to view stress differently, it actually triggers the body. Your body responds differently when you view something differently. So when you don't view stress as, oh my goodness, I can't do this and it's, and we're all gonna die. No, view it as, oh, a challenge instead, instead of a, a threat and re choose to connect with those around you. So your resources and your perception. Yeah, interesting study, go watch, go watch the TED Talks. So you got a lot of TED Talks here to watch. Okay, so when I get stressed or lots going on, is it okay, Dr. Dave, to share this, to call up my mom or to call up my sister, call up my friends? And, and complain, complain about all the stress and the tough times. Well, of course, the academic answer is always, it depends, it depends. So complaining just to complain, just to get it off my chest or you know, just to vent to somebody, it, it may not be helpful. And this is why. It can often, because as soon as you start talking about the stress, 
it, your mind starts feeling like, okay, yep, I'm stressed because I'm talking about it and now there's a lot of stress going on. And so you you bring up the very emotions, in counseling, right? I went through it. I, well, let's start back. Tell me what happened back in your childhood and, and maybe I was molested or some horrific things. Then I go to the next counselor. Tell me about your childhood. And the more and more that we bring that stuff up, it can trigger more and more anxiety and stress unless, unless, Unless you also think about the, the why the event happened, what you have learned and what you can do now about it. So yeah, you can start with a complaint, but the goal is to move beyond that, to process it in healthy ways. And what, what have I learned from that? Instead of just venting to vent is not always the best thing because again, it creates more stress the more that you talk about stress and process it. So we have to rethink and we have to reframe stress. The lesson is, is stop dwelling on it and sharing it because it leads to more stress and anxiety and depression. And as we'll soon learn, when we're so consumed with stress, we can't be thinking about other things that are going on. So viewing it as a challenge instead of a threat and take it and say, okay, what's the meaning behind this stress? Because all stress has meaning or it wouldn't be stressful. And so what is it? Process it. Take a some deep breaths and think, okay, I can handle, this is my body. I can feel my heart starting to race, preparing me for, for this challenge. So our brains, our brains have two modes, okay? We have the focused and the interested, which I'm sure all 467 of you right now are just focused and interested, right? No, you're not. Okay, it's the focused and the interested, and we have the default, which is the uninterested. And, and what happens is, Throughout the day, we're constantly going back and, and forth with all of these. Now, when the world is really interesting, like right, like this, this Zoom, then we're we're all in and we're using all of this capacity and our attention is all there, but it takes effort. And we couldn't actually pay attention all day because we would be we would be drained. Some, uh, you know, medical field or others where they're right there and they're doing surgeries, yeah, they, they're drained because they have to pay attention so much and we have limited. But the default, the uninterested, when the world is boring, then the brain really sulks. It just goes to this default mode. And, and a wandering mind, right, it doesn't cost you anything, but it's very expensive because what it often does, a wandering mind tends to wander where? It tends to wander to the stress and what I have coming up. And when you can't sleep at night, it's because there's worry and there's concern and there's stress, right? So that's what happens um, with the, in default, we tend to go negative. And again, all day long, we're switching back and forth be, between these. Okay, so, and research shows, Again, most of our thoughts in the default are neutral or negative. And so that's why, that's why your brain doesn't have much fun when you leave it alone with itself. So is mind wandering positive or, or negative? Well, there was a study done by um, Matt Killingsworth and Dan Gilbert. And what they did is they had an app and then they had over 15,000 um, readings of this. And they would send people a question, just a little interruption and say, hey, what are you doing right now? right? It would just come on their phone that say, okay, what are you doing? And are you paying attention to what you're doing? And how are you feeling? So they wanted to find out, you know, how often are people mind wandering? And it turns out the mind wandering rate on average, about 47% of the time when we're engaged in a task, we're not focusing on what we're doing. Isn't that wild? And it ranges from self-care, right? Taking a shower. How many of you ladies, right? Getting ready this morning, you're putting on your makeup. Well, some of you probably don't have your makeup because you're in your jammies still. And you're like, okay, yeah, this looks really good. Self-care, almost, yeah, we're hardly ever are really paying attention, focused. We're usually in the default in the mind wandering. And it goes from commuting, you're driving, you ever gotten to work, you're, you've come home and you're like, man, how did I get here? The car just goes there. It happens a lot. Or working, I'm working, I'm working. You're not working. About half the time, 47% of the time, you're thinking about something other than what you're actually doing at work. Look at it with, with taking care of your kids. How many of you are guilty of this? Child comes up and says, hey, mom, mom, look at this, or dad, look at this. And you look over and you say, oh man, that's great, honey. You have no idea what they just said, right? Because our minds tend to wander. We, we go on this autopilot mode a lot, eating, exercising, talking, making love. Yeah, don't ask your partner about that one. What about Zoom calls? So I totally made this one up. But I, about 98% of the time, I'm thinking, right, most of you, your mind has wandered because you, it's either not interesting or something else is, is happening. This, so this is a great case study of how well we're able to, to pay attention. So why does all this matter? 
Well, first we need the default mode because the, the default activity, it's good, right? You get in the shower and you have these thoughts or sometimes, you know, some of your best thoughts um, happen when you're in the default mode. But the, the danger happens when we, ex uh, we, there's too much time, too much time and we constantly dwell on stress and imperfections and all the crummy things that are going on in the world or we're watching the news constantly, and th which is kind of default right mode and our mind kind of wanders in and out. Okay, now, which leads to this. And in my mind, this is one of the most uh, important slides that we're talking about. Okay, all of us experience emotions, even right now, even if you're in the default mode, you're in the uninterested mode right now. All of us experience emotions in the present, but many of our emotions are anchored in the past or in the future. For, for example, look at this one, the past. Grief, and now these are important emotions, so I'm not, I'm not saying don't experience these. I'm just saying don't set up camp in these emotions. Anger, anger is always about something, we can feel it now, but it's about something that has happened in the past. We're so upset about something that someone said to my child or someone cut me off and it's in the past, but we keep stewing about it. Same with guilt and shame is always in the past. Okay, what about, what about the future? Oh, you know this, it's all about things that haven't happened yet. It's worry and it's anxiety, it's stress, it's helplessness, it's tension. But do you see what happens? That we set up camp often in the future or in the past, and what do we miss out on? We're missing out on the present, on the good stuff that happens right here and now, on the happiness and joy and interest and surprise and calmness and all these wonderful emotions that tend to happen in the present, that we experience them in the present. Instead, we're so caught up in the past and, and, or worried um, and stressed about the, the future. So our brain, it's wired really to focus on, on three things. Really to wire, when we're, you know, we're interested in there, it's really interested in three things. One is pleasure. Anything that, that brings pleasure, that is, yes, that brings joy and happiness right now. Yes, I, I wanna do this, let's go. Let's go out to eat or a big hunk of cheesecake. Pleasure. Another one that it focuses on is novelty, something that's new and interesting. That's why, right? That's why if you're scrolling through Instagram and you get to, or you've seen that post before, you hurry and scroll through it because it's not new. The brain craves new and novelty, something that's really interesting to it. And that, yeah, it tries to figure it, figure it out. And then the last thing it is focused on is threat. Threats. Now, when these three compete, pleasure, novelty and threat. Which, which one's going to win? It's going to be threat. It's going to be threat almost every time. Threat. And do you remember this really relates back to what? The three needs of safety, satisfaction, and connection. And this one's safety. Fundamentally, uh, we'll do everything in our, in our, we can to, to be safe. And so threat. And so how does this relate to what we're talking about with trauma and stress and all that's going on? Our, our default in many instances, if we've got a lot of trauma, a lot of stress, a lot of worry in our life, we're going here. But what does that mean? It means we're not paying attention to all the other good stuff that's happening. In fact, we're born with five times as many neurons that are wired for negativity and threat for every one that is wired for positivity and opportunity. Again, five times as many that are wired for threat and negativity for every one that's wired for, for all positivity. In fact, we're wired, we're five times as likely to notice, see the negative and notice the takes. Now, did you see it? Did you, did you see, I misspelled it on purpose because our brains are wired to notice the negative. I'll prove it. Your child comes home with a report card. They've got five A's and a C minus. <clears throat> Where's your brain go? <laughs> right to the C minus immediately, immediately. Right? Or your husband walks out in his shirt untucked or whatever, or he's got, we look for flaws and imperfections. You green grass? Well, we don't have grass in Utah right now because it's, especially here in Logan, we won't see it till May. But we see brown spot instead of all the green Christmas lights. I drove by right during that Christmas season and, and our, we had one light bulb burned out. So where does my attention go? It goes to the one dang bulb that's burned out. So we're drawn to the negative. We're drawn to people's imperfections. We nitpick them. In our children, in our spouses and partners, we're wired for negativity five times as much. And so we're drawn really to imperfections more than to positive qualities. We have to first be aware of that.
And then we have to work five times as hard to notice the good uh, in others. So we get easily distracted with, with stress because our brains right now, our brains are presented with about 11 million pieces of information. A lot of the stuff, maybe some of you can hear my voice, but maybe you're scrolling Instagram, you're talking with somebody else and all this stuff is happening. Or maybe some of you need to use the bathroom or you're hungry or whatever it is. So internal signals and external stuff that's coming at us, 11 million pieces of information. And we can only focus on about 40 bits 40 little, we call it attention, but my attention's here and then it's here because right now I guarantee no one right now is thinking about their left pinky toe, okay? Well, now you are because I told you that, but you weren't before because we can only focus on a little things here and then there, right? ADHD, our attention's all over, our 40 bits, we're all over the place, okay? So that means we get to choose. When I first saw this, I was like, Dave, this is nuts. I get to choose my 40 bits. I get to choose what to, to focus on and dismiss or ignore. But again, we're wired for threats, right? We're wired if someone came, you know, if I made a loud noise and we all jump because we're wired to pay attention to, to threats. And so ultimately our reality is a choice. Part of that perception, remember the stress and our perception and the resources, how we perceive the stress. We, we get to choose that. And so how, what we choose to focus on, it really shapes um, how you perceive stress. So here's the trade-off. I can think about the negatives and all the news and all the crazy stuff, just negativity, negativity, negativity all the time. But that means my 40 bits are already consumed there. And that means that I can't see the positive or I can shift my mindset and choose to see the good around me. Now, that doesn't mean that, oh, yeah, just ignore all the bad, just only focus on the good. That's not my message. You can process the yucky and the negative with other people or counselors or work through it, but don't, don't get stuck in the past or in the future. Learning to enjoy the present because when you have stressful stuff going on, we're, our default is to get distracted and to focus on that. Okay. So some of you probably uh, have seen this study. So this study was back um, done about 20 years ago. And what they did is the invisible gorilla study. So what they did is they had people watch. They said, okay, count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball, right? So they have these, it's just, this is actually a picture from the actual video. And they've got some dressed in black and some dressed in white and they're passing a basketball and they have to count how many times in the black team, you know, those in black shirts, they're, they're passing back the, a basketball. And so they're really focused on one, one, two. And then right in the middle of this, this gorilla comes walking out. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? And just pounds his chest, pounds his chest really quick and then walks right off. So they get done with the study and they say, all right, how many times? And the people are like, 15. Oh, that's great. Yes, it is. Did you see anything else? And more than half the time, the people will say no. They, they didn't see it. They missed the gorilla. In fact, it's funny. They'll even say um, there was a gorilla, you know, that walked in and pounded his chest. And they, they won't believe it. And so they'll actually have to rewind the video and show them the gorilla that came in. And they're like, whoa, they're blown away. They can't believe that they missed it. Why? Because when we're focused on something and we're not paying attention to all the other things that are going on, it's called inattentional blindness. Okay, inattentional blindness. That means we're blind to anything we're not actively paying attention to. How, how often does that happen, right? You're on your phones and someone says something and right, or your, your husband or you, you're on the couch watching a basketball game and, and honey, they can't even hear you. You lose your sense of hearing because all your 40 bits are drawn to whatever you're, you're doing. So the same principle applies right to the present moment. If I'm, if I'm just kind of lost, then I'm not paying attention to the other things that are going on. What about this? So I took this picture when we were, uh, took the SRAM fam to San Diego went out to dinner at a Mexican restaurant. I look over and this dad's on his phone. The entire time this, the son is eating his, his dessert. It happened the other day. My wife and I um, took our, our son to Pizza Pie Cafe and this mom's on her phone. The entire time the kids are getting down, getting their own little thing. And they're just little kids, but no attention because it's all there. That means it's not on, on their children or our partner. Now, this is interesting because the same couple, they come and sit down in the same seats that that father and that son were at. And they sit down, they start pulling out their phones, which just drives me nuts. And then my kids are like, dad, you're not paying attention to us because you take a picture of everybody on your phones and you're on your phone. It's like, oh man, yes, it, it consumes us, right? So inattentional blindness. I'm not paying attention because I'm paying attention to something else or work 
right? If I'm focusing on, on work, I, I'm not paying attention to others. Or if I'm focusing on something else, I'm not paying attention to work. Our driving, this happens all the time. So the, the whole point of this is what's our brain wired to focus on? What's our brain drawn to? It, it's threat and stress and negativity and trauma and everything else. It will consume you. If you don't take a step back and pause, take a, big, a look at the bigger picture, because our blinders are on, and all we see is the white team passing, the, the white shirts passing the ball, we, we miss the gorilla, or we miss our partner, or we miss our kids, or we miss the good stuff. There's great things happening, even during a pandemic. There's great things that are happening in the world. So we get distracted easily. So do we focus on the, our favorite things, right? Raindrops on roses. Okay, I won't, I won't say whiskers on kittens, that whole thing. What are your favorite things? And our favorite things, they can only influence our mood if we notice them. So we have to notice them. And our, our favorite people can only influence us and our mood and our love and our appreciation for them only grow if we notice them. So one of my points is this, slow down and find the good, and feel the good, and feed the good, the slow down, and just savor it for a minute, just to soak it all in for a second, and stay with it. When something good happens, don't move on to the next task. Just celebrate it, even 10 seconds, because here's the principle. Negativity is like Velcro. It just sticks to your brain, and positivity, when something positive happens, it's like Teflon, and it just comes and it just is gone. It just goes so fast. And we don't just hold on to it for a minute and talk about it. So in the SRAM fan, we do happy thought. At the end of the night, we celebrate the good, the happy, the fun things that we enjoy, the things that brought us, that made us happy that day. And so I start, my wife goes, and each of our children, they say one thing that made them happy that day. You can do it at dinner, dinner time, but you've got to find places to talk about the good, to notice the good, to feel, and then feed it. Feed the good to make it last longer and put it in your, in your memory. Ultimately, it's this. There's things that matter, and then there's things that I can control. And if we can learn to focus on that middle part of things that matter, all the rest is noise. A lot of the stress we can't do anything about. So focus on the things that matter and the things that can control. And there's a little bit right there. Make that something that you can do it about and something that really matters. I, I love that. So pay attention to those things. Give that your 40 bits. Not, not all this other distraction and all this other this stuff that's going on. So why, why do we react the way that we do? Okay, we're born with about 80, stick with me, right? We're born with about 86 billion brain cells called neurons. And so if, imagine, right, a newborn baby, some of you have newborn, new grandbaby or something. They're, when they're born, they're born with about that many. And then, just like if it were to start raining on this big pile of dirt, that water would hit, and then it comes down, and it starts making these little channels, right, in this dirt. And that's the same thing that happens in, in babies and brain cells and neurons. The first few years are so important. The whole point of this is that we are wired early on to learn how to... Um, to react, right, to stress. If you grew up in a very stressful and a hostile environment and there wasn't a lot of nurturing, then your brain is wired to respond to stress differently, differently than someone that was nurtured and had this warm environment. They're wired differently. If you grew up with parents who were yellers, you're wired differently. If you were you know, born with others that didn't, you never saw your parents fight. Our brains are wired differently depending on our experiences our environment and what's happening. At the peak of this, I think it's pretty phenomenal. About 1 million connections every second. Like when babies are one, two, three years old, all these connections are happening. Now, can we rewire the brain? Once you're wired and you've had all this trauma and, and these horrible experiences, thank goodness, yeah, yes. It's called neuroplasticity. And we used to think that we can't rewire the brain. We can rewire the brain. But it takes time, healing, counseling, and then infusing things from a different perspective. So our genetics, talking about genetics even, about half of our happiness we inherit from our, our parents. So you can either thank or right, curse your, your parents for happiness. Genetics and depression, anxiety, other thing, mental health, a lot of it is, um, is inherited. So what about, the other, what about the other slice of that happiness? Well, about 10% is our circumstances. And that's even who you're married to. In your money, your car, your watch, the kind of home that you have, all that stuff, it plays a small role. 
but not a lasting role. In fact, we get used to so, so many things. You get a new purse, right, ladies, or a new pair of shoes, and then it kind of wears off. 72 hours and it's gone. I need, need something else. Or you go to a hotel and it's great the first day, second play, second day, third day, it's a dump, right? We get used to things so easily. So what about the, the 40%? This is the, the part that I get super excited about because this is intentional activity. These are your thoughts. These are your behaviors. This is what you get to control. You don't have much control over what happened to you as a child, but you have a heck of a lot more control on how you process what happened to you as a child and how much you, you go there. Uh, again, counseling and, and other help is, is important. So when the brain is positive, first talk about the benefits of, of a positive brain. I'll, I'll fly through some of these. So much happens in our brain. When it's positive, it turns on all the learning centers of the brain. We're more productive. Intelligence rises. Energy rises. And that last one, dopamine, it turns on, right, all the, the learning centers in the brain. And we perceive things. And here's a key point. We perceive things as less stressful. When you are positive, you perceive things as less stressful. Yes, there's stress. But you've built up so much positivity in your, your brain that you see it differently. And I'll show you some, some of these. And so really what it's a matter of, of increasing positives in stress, decreasing what we can, the negatives, but increasing and boosting what we do have control over. And that's some of the positives that I'll talk about. So increasing the positives, decreasing uh, the negatives. Huge one. Uh, is gratitude. Now around the holidays, I saw all kinds of, uh, here in Utah, all kinds of posts on, on gratitude. And I loved it because the research here has is simply exploded on how wonderful gratitude is. Now, even if you're going through cancer, I had a great friend um, who went through horrible cancer and 20 bladder infections in, in two years, had his bladder removed. Okay. Still found time to be grateful because gratitude is something that we get to control. I love that, the impact of gratitude. So what do I use? I use an amazing app. It's called the Five Minute Journal app, okay? I love it, love it, because in the morning it says three things that you're grateful for at the end of the day, three amazing things that happened that day, and then I get to take a picture. I'm very visual, and so I take a picture of the day, and then it helps me remember what happened uh, that day. And then as I review that, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember this and this. And so it fills my mind with gratitude and happiness. Um, another great TED Talk. So put this one on your, your must-watch list. This is by um, a monk, David Steinel Ross. And he says this. He says, in daily life, we must see that it is not happiness that makes us grateful, but gratefulness that makes us happy. He says, gratefulness is the key to a happy life that we hold in our hands because if we're not grateful... And no matter how much we have, we will not be happy because we will always want to have something else or something more. That we're not happy with our circumstances, but we can find something to be grateful for. Okay, that's like that's Instagram worthy, right? Post that on your blog, dang it. Gratitude, that, that's powerful. Okay, and now this one. This one is one of my favorites. This is by Dr. Robert Emmons, and he's written those two books are some of my favorite on gratitude. He says, We know from studies that gratitude helps us recover from loss and trauma. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What? That's what this, this whole symposium is about. Gratitude helps us recover from loss and trauma. It helps us to deal with the slow drip of everyday stress, as well as the massive personal upheavals in the face of suffering and pain and loss and trials and tribulations. He says, basically everything. Gratitude is absolutely essential. It's part of our psychological immune system. Now, if we could put gratitude in a pill, our people would pay thousands of dollars to feel the happiness, to feel the effects of everything that I just showed on those uh, that reduce thoughts of suicide even and reduce anxiety and stress, gratitude. And then he says it's it's psychological immune system. And so this, this is a key point because if we're, right, our minds, our hearts are full of gratitude, then when the negative stuff does come and it will, it will surely come, but we can process it differently already because we filled our minds with so much things that we're grateful for that it doesn't have quite the negative effect, just like we boost with the vitamins and veggies, and that's what gratitude is. And so it doesn't mean that we won't get sick or bad stuff won't happen, but we can recover faster with a stronger immune system, and that's the psychological immune system, gratitude. 
Okay. Another one is, is kindness, random racks, random acts of kindness. This is one of the most powerful things you can do. In fact, Martin Seligman, the father of positive psychology, he says, doing a kind act produces the single most reliable momentary increase in well-being of any exercise that they've ever tested. And so, and so try it. Even try it right now if you want. Text somebody a random text of gratitude right now. Just get on and be and say, hey, you know, I sure miss your, your daughter or son in school. Just, you know, send them a text. Um, a parent, a grandparent, a friend, send them a text right now of just pure gratitude, love, appreciation. And, and watch what happens, okay? And I call this exercise, I call it text two before 10. Text two people before 10 a.m. and try it. Try it for three days, seven days. You do it for 21 days, you'll be, you'll be hooked and you'll have increases in your resources because more people, you'll be going out to lunch with people, you'll be connecting and say, hey, yeah, let's catch up sometime. Random acts of kindness of all the things that they've, they've done, all the studies on happiness. He says, this one will improve your positivity because guess what? Have you seen a pattern here? Kindness is never about you. Gratitude is never about you. Stress and anxiety and all that, it's always about you and it turns you inward. But when you, when you can focus on other people and on doing good and being good and being grateful, then it sure helps battle, again, that psychological immune system that it, that it improves. Okay, another one, finding flow. Finding flow. Flow is that, that time when you lose track of time because you're so immersed in, a, in an activity. Right, so finding flow, and it could be gardening or playing the piano, doing something worthwhile. My dad, my dad, it's amazing. So my, if I could show you in here, right, the things that he's carved, he carves his ornaments, but he just carved, and he lose track of time, I think, right, as he's doing all this carving. So finding some that you, you love to do, yeah, it could be out on the slopes, and it's just time just goes so fast because you use all 40 bits. Remember the 40 bits? You use all 40 bits in that activity. Instead of like sitting, don't watch, sit there and watch TV or scroll. That, that's not flow. That's a waste of time. Okay, so he says, um, Mihai Chik sent Mihai. He says, it's a state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience is so enjoyable that people will continue to do it, even at great cost for the sheer sake of doing it. So volunteering, the food pantry, getting involved, doing something, getting out of the chair, doing something. That is so good for depression and stress and anxiety. He says, the best moments in our lives are not the passive, receptive, relaxing times at the beach in Hawaii. Okay, those are good times too. He doesn't say that. He says, the best moments usually occur if a person's body or mind is stretched to its limits in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. So I love that one. Okay, humor. Humor is another good, another good one, right? How many of you, the Bernie Sanders stuff, if you, if you can't laugh at some of that stuff and just learn to say, okay, yeah, yeah, this is funny. These are some of my favorites. And then you can see that I, I love this. I love, um, yeah, my wife's I'm gonna kill me. But this, this is my mask. She won't let me wear it at the store. But I love, because hey, why not? Why not see the brighter side of things? And so sometimes I'll jump on Zoom meetings for, for school stuff with our educators and I'll dress up as you can see, right? That Dr. Shram dog and I just turn in, but it's important to find the lighter side of stuff because the research on laughter, smiling, humor is amazing. Immediately, look at this, improves sleep and social bonds and anger. And actually you live longer. They've done studies on this. People who are happier and smile and laugh and see the brighter side of things, even during tough times. Now, you can't always laugh at everything. Of course, there's serious things. Then there's tragedy and there's sickness and there's death and divorce and horrible things. But if we can at times learn to see the brighter and the humorous side of things. Okay, exercise can reduce anxiety and stress by up to 20%. Uh, don't need to yeah, preach about that one. That one's, that one's huge. Mindfulness and meditation helps us to, right, yoga even, being able to be centered and relax because your mind doesn't tend to wander off on stress. It's the here and now, in the present moment, and that's really what that's about, is being in the present moment, taking some deep breaths, instead of going, drifting to the past, because remember, the default mind is a wandering mind, and a wandering mind is not always the best place to be because it wanders to unhealthy things. It tends to, to those unhealthy areas in our lives. 
So simply, that's why Google, they have, they tell people to get off, right? They send a little text out, take your hands off your keyboard, close your eyes and just breathe, pay, count your breaths for two minutes, then put your hands back on the keyboard and work. These little hacks, they work, they work and they're for, for some people and they can be helpful. So three keys, three keys for a happier life. This is a view, I mean, from Cash Valley, right? We look at it on our, on our deck and we see this and you think, pause, just soak that in for a minute and just absorb it and then come back to dinner and, and later. But man, can't miss the, the good things that are happening. And the first one is find and process the gems in your past. Look past and maybe you had crummy past and there's trauma and betrayal and just horrific things. You can choose, you can choose, your 40 bits can choose to focus on that or you can choose to find the gems in your past. The good things, the great you know, experiences, the wonderful people in your past, uh, the experiences that bring you joy. Focus on those, look at a scrapbook or home movies, find the gems in your past. Second, learn to enjoy and find the good in the present. The happiest people I know, the happiest people I know have learned to enjoy their day. I've learned, learned to enjoy today. What's happened? What has happened? And that's why I love the five minute journal app. I can journal the great things that happened that day. A happy thought at night. Hey kids, tell us about the happiest part of your day. Okay. And looking forward with hope to the future. You got to have either, you know, it's a lunch day out with my friend or a vacation or a trip or a break or a ski trip, something, look, find something to look forward to plan something, have some plans to look forward to because that brings us hope, relief. Yes, maybe you don't have to people get vaccinated or whatever it is, having something that we can go out and live life again. And it can, again, it can be, uh, you know, going out, a walk in the park, something to look forward to and, and to plan. So how do we become better after the bitter? We turn to our resources. We turn to our resources and the best ones are the people. The, the family members, the loved ones, our community, our faith community, turn to the resources of, of what you have and practice positivity. It's real. Try it, right? I'm living proof. And I have bad days and there's stress, but then I can process it in, in healthier ways. And I perceive stress differently. My, my personality is more of a Hey, you know, it'll be fine. It's going to be fine. I even have a shirt that says, I'm fine. You're fine. Everything's going to be fine. It's all fine. Be, the email. Being able to, to see that, drawing your resources and, and perceive things. So let me, I, I love this quote by Thich Nhat Hanh. He teaches, your mind is like a piece of land planted with many different kinds of seeds. Seeds of joy, peace, mindfulness, understanding, and love. Seeds of craving, anger, fear, hate, and forgetfulness. These many different kinds of seeds are always there, sleeping in the soil of your mind. The quality of your life depends on the seeds you water. Or I would say pay attention to. If you plant tomato seeds in your gardens, tomatoes will grow. Just so, if you water a seed of peace in your mind, peace will grow. When the seeds of happiness in you are watered, you will become happy. When the seed of anger in you is, is watered, you will become angry. He concludes, the seeds that are watered frequently are those that will grow strong. And so I, I ask, as I wrap up, which seeds are you watering? Which, where's your 40 bits? Are you, are you in the past? Is it the future? Are you able to balance that and pay attention to the present moment? Choose. You choose your 40 bits of what you focus on and how you process things. So I, I've, here's some of Dave's face. Some people say, Dave, Dr. Dave, you know, recommend some of my, here's some of my most favorite books. Now, The Upward Spiral, I added. That's my favorite book that I've ever read so far on stress and anxiety. I buy it, honestly, by the by the dozens. And I give it away. I give it away to people. I give it to students who are, because it's so down to earth, it's so practical and it's science backed. Um, Alex Corb, a great friend, he's at UCLA, neuroscientist, but he doesn't write like one. Humorous, but th these science, and it's not a thick book. It's very down to earth. Our daughters, her teenage daughters have read it. It's very um, simple, simple little things that can actually create this upward um, spiral. Blinkist, Blinkist is an app. You can listen to these and all these other books, the 15 minute version of the book. I've listened to over 200 books on Blinkist. So it's 15 minutes um, of like the best of the best they take out of the book. And if I like it, then I buy it. So anyway, I like that one. Uh, between Parent and Child, one of the all-time great parenting books. So these are parenting um, books. If you're looking for something, man, I'm struggling. 
but the, these are some of the, my, my go-tos uh, that I go to for, for parenting books. So we want to take a picture of, of that slide or whatever, but a lot of good information out there, but there's a lot of not so good information out there. I like the science backed stuff by, by scholars and researchers who say, yeah, this is the, this is the good stuff. Um, some of my favorite apps and uh, websites, podcasts to check out on a happiness and positivity. You see the five minute journal. That's what that one looks like. If you're looking for that, there's some imitators out there. I don't know how well they do. Um, Live happy now, happify the happiness lab. I'll get on the, the elliptical in the morning and just exercise and listen to some of these. And it's so good. It's such good information to, yeah, wow, kindness and compassion and finding meaning in life and purpose. That, that's what these are about. So if those are helpful, but let me wrap up with this. So meaningful words, right? These motivating words at the, the end of all this from our eight-year-old daughter. And if, if some of you have seen this, if you've seen me present before, but have you ever had that date when you just can't get your kids to bed fast enough? And you're just like, you know, get your bed, stay in your bed, stay in your bed, stay in it. And you're like, you know, $20 bill for anyone who stays in their bed. You just get so stressed and you start to lose it and you start to lose it on your kiddos. And I, I did that. Okay. And I was, I remember in Missouri, we were there for nine years as a professor four kids, you know, like eight, four, six to two, and just so stressed, like knock it off, stay in your beds. And then I go back to our room and I'm like regretting it. I'm like, ah, I'm frustrated as a parent. And then I hear it. I hear it. These footsteps are coming down the hall and I hear it. I'm like, oh, I'm going to let them have it. And then I hear something on the door. And that's why I say, get back to your room. And I go back to the room and I go to the door. I open it up and there's a note. There's a note from our eight-year-old daughter. And this is a picture of the actual note. And she says, thanks a lot. I know it can be hard being a mom or dad, but you got to stick with it. And I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, right? Here's Dr. Dave, 10 years of school. And I'm, yeah, and I'm happy. And I'm the best parent ever. And no, I blow it. I have bad days and I have stresses. And now yeah, my parents, or my parents, my, my parents are amazing. My children, they have to drive me nuts sometimes. But I says, look on the back. Do you see that on the notes? Look on the back. And so I turn the, back, the, the note over and read it. And it says, don't worry. We still love you. I think, oh man. So a lot of it is sticking with it. It's sticking, find one of these, these little happy hacks, these things that you can do. Try it. Try that upward spiral. Try to remember what you're focusing on, paying attention. You find when you're distracted and you're just kind of yeah, going through life. Some of the, sometimes that's good. I just need some downtime. I don't want to think about anything. That's great. In fact, yeah, downtime and some time that default mode uh, can be healthy. But wow, f- try, try some of this. To, especially during the still kind of uncertain times and things are still kind of shut down. I can't see my parents. Try some of that. Now, I, I, I post all kinds of um, happy stuff, parenting and marriage tips on my Facebook page, Dr. Dave USU, that you see there. Um, little video clips and Thrive in Five and, and two minute tips that I try to help bring happiness and hope and parenting tips, marriage tips to, to this, yeah, this world that, that really needs a lot of this dose. And again, the, the slides, all the slides, if you want any of that, go grab it at drdaveshram.com. Um, so I hope that's helpful. I'll stop sharing and I'll turn it back over to the team.